Philippines is the United States' oldest ally in the Indo-Pacific. Our relationship is based on the shared interests and values of Americans and Filipinos, including our abiding commitment to democracy. Uh, for decades, we've worked together to promote peace and stability across the region. And we're growing that effective partnership in scale and scope every single day, including through very productive, uh, very rich discussions uh, today. Uh, our security alliance is an enduring source of strength for both of our nations. Uh, today, we focused on ways to continue our close partnership under the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement so that our forces can work even more closely together, including to provide humanitarian assistance and respond to disasters. Uh, Secretary Austin and I also reaffirmed the United States' unwavering commitment to standing with the Philippines against any intimidation or coercion, including in the South China Sea, and to preserving a region that's governed by international law where goods and ideas and people can move freely. We also discussed deepening our robust economic ties, including through the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. Uh, we're working closely with other IPEF partners to build out this framework to help our economies grow faster and fairer so that all our people can reach their full potential, lead on issues shaping the 21st century economy, and do it in a way that is sustainable for our planet. Uh, one way that we're putting our partnership uh, through IPEF to work is by collaborating to increase economic opportunities for women and girls in the Philippines. We're providing training in growing industries like data science and artificial intelligence, where women have been underrepresented, and boosting digital literacy rates. And more broadly, as we discussed today, we're committed to expanding our economic cooperation across the board. Indeed, we discussed a number of areas where we can deepen our collaboration and cooperation in pursuit of that goal. Uh, together, we're stepping up to address global challenges that no country can solve alone. We discussed our shared efforts to combat the climate crisis and strengthen energy security. The United States is committed to helping the Philippines reach its ambitious goal of reducing its greenhouse gas, gas emissions by 75 percent by 2030. Uh, to do that, the U.S. government and, critically, the private sector are supporting the growth of uh, the offshore wind market, the development of nickel and cobalt facilities that will help the Philippines sustainable process, sustainably process minerals essential to the clean energy transition. Uh, we're also providing technical assistance and regulatory guidance to support the growth of the Philippines' civil nuclear energy program. Um, we're looking to grow our cooperation through a 1-2-3 agreement on civil nuclear cooperation, which will make it easier for us to share technical knowledge as well as nuclear material and equipment. We're delivering solutions to the food security challenges impacting the Philippines, like so many other countries. Uh, Philippines-based companies, with the support of the United States government and the American private sector, are making impressive progress in developing climate-smart food systems, increasing their productivity, and the sustainability of their supply chains. We're looking forward to continuing this progress at the inaugural U.S.-Philippines Food Security Dialogue a little bit later this year. We're able to do this work not only because of the partnership between our governments, but also because of the partnership between our peoples. This year, we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright Program in the Philippines, the longest-running Fulbright Program in the world. More than 22,000 Filipinos have come to the United States through the Fulbright and other U.S. exchange programs, enriching our communities uh, with their perspectives and experiences, innovating and launching businesses, building enduring bonds between our people, bonds that to this day renew and revitalize the friendship between our countries. Across all of these areas and more, the United States values and is proud of our robust and deepening partnership with the Philippines. Secretary Austin and I appreciated the opportunity to discuss in depth how we'll make this essential relationship even stronger in the months and years ahead. So really grateful to our colleagues for being here today, grateful to their teams, the hard work that's been done, but uh, not grateful simply for their presence, but also the spirit in which together we are working to strengthen the bonds between our countries. Ricky, over to you. Thank you very much, Tony. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Lloyd J. Austin III, Senior Undersecretary in OIC Carlito G. Galvez, Jr., uh, friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here in Washington and to address all of you today. Some of you were with Secretary Blinken when we held our first meeting uh, in our current capacities in Manila last August. We agreed then to work together in sustaining the positive momentum and trajectory of Philippine-U.S. relations, including by reconvening our 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue in 2023. And I'm happy to report that we have, in fact, followed through on that commitment. 
Today is only the third iteration of our dialogue in the 2 plus 2 format since it was established in 2012. After a seven-year gap since the second meeting in 2016, this meeting holds particular significance as it further reaffirms our shared commitment to advancing our common priorities as treaty allies and close partners amidst evolving regional and global security challenges. The joint statement we will issue today and the various areas it covers demonstrates the breadth and depth of our bilateral relationship. We've reached a number of key understandings that the Philippines believes will truly elevate our relationship and translate into direct, substantial, and tangible benefits for our peoples and countries. At today's meeting, we redoubled our commitment to modernizing the Philippine-U.S. alliance, recognizing that our partnership will need to play a stronger role in preserving an international law-based international order. This means ensuring the conduct of high-level and high-impact, high-value joint exercises, trainings, and other related activities. We especially welcome the United States' pledge to fast-track and ramp up support for the modernization of our defense, civilian law enforcement, and humanitarian assistance and disaster response uh, capabilities, especially in the maritime domain, as well as the implementation of EDCA projects and investments in and, in and around EDCA agreed locations. I wish to point out that we also underscored the importance of equally ensuring that our modern alliance not only serves as an instrument of peace, but it shall also be a force for good that brings about sustained economic benefits to our two countries, down to our local communities. Our discussions and proposed ways forward are aligned with the Philippines' priorities on agriculture, food security, promoting energy security as we transition to clean energy, boosting trade, and building resilience of our supply chains, as well as enhancing connectivity and digitalization. Our discussions focus also on areas such as economic cooperation, climate change, renewable energy, economic resilience, and economic security. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Secretary Blinken, Secretary Manalo, and Secretary Galvez. I'm honored to be here with you today for the third U.S.-Philippines 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue. As you've heard, it's the first of its kind in, in seven years. But first, let me just say a few words about the story that I know many of you are tracking. I was first briefed on the reports of unauthorized disclosure of sensitive and classified material on the morning of April 6th. And since then, I've been convening senior department leaders daily on our response, and I've directed an urgent cross-department effort. And we've referred the matter to the Department of Justice, which has opened a criminal investigation. Now, I can't say much more while the Justice Department's investigation is ongoing, but we take this very seriously, and we will continue to work closely with our outstanding allies and partners, and nothing will ever stop us from keeping America secure. Now, let me turn to today's important discussions. We've come together at an historic moment in our alliance. For more than seven decades, U.S. and Philippine forces have trained and fought alongside each other. And today, we're building on those bonds to bring greater security, stability, and prosperity to the Indo-Pacific for the next 70 years and beyond. The commitments that we made today will spur even deeper cooperation to help ensure that we're poised to tackle the defining challenges of our time, together. We all reaffirm today that our mutual defense treaty remains the bedrock of our cooperation. As Secretary Blinken and I have said clearly and repeatedly, the mutual defense treaty applies to armed, armed attacks on either of our armed forces, our aircraft, or public vessels, including our Coast Guard anywhere in the South China Sea. And so today we built on our work together during my recent visit
to Manila and discuss plans to operationalize the four Okay, Manalo. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. First of all, we would like to take this moment to express our profoundest thanks to the U.S. We are grateful to the U.S. government and the American people for their kind assistance in our current environmental sea disaster in containing the oil spill in Oriental Mindoro. Upon our request for assistance, the Secretary of Defense, the U.S. Embassy, and the U.S. Navy manifested their unwavering support through the, its deployment of the remotely operated vehicle or ROV, as well as the technical support provided by the U.S. Coast Guard and the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, to help contain an oil spill. The timely and efficient response of our allies in providing the technical and material support amounting to more than 20 million U.S. dollars was very instrumental in mitigating the impact of this environmental disaster on our coastal communities that may affect millions of Filipino people. The aid and cooperation demonstrates the strength of the Philippine-U.S. Defense Alliance. And we are very proud to be partner of the United States and your commitment to assisting us in this time of need has reinforced the band of friendship and mutual, mutual trust between our nations. We will not forget. As the boxing star, I would like also to like to reiterate our appreciation for the 3.6 million vaccine doses donated by the U.S. government to the Philippines, which saved millions of Filipino lives and helped our economy to recover. Today, we have just concluded the third two plus two ministerial meeting between the Philippines and the United States. And I am pleased to announce that it had been a most productive meeting which expanded to even to economic security. The last time the two plus two ministerial consultation were convened was in January 2016. The fact that we are able to convene once again highlights the continued importance and relevance of our partnership and the need for continued dialogue and cooperation on matters of mutual interest. It is also noteworthy that this is the first time the meeting will be convened under the Marcos administration, which highlights the Philippine government's commitment to strengthening our alliance with the United States. Our meeting today will set the direction that we would like to be the Philippine-U.S. alliance to take in consideration of our present-day realities and common security challenges. Along this line, I wish to emphasize the strength and the credibility of the Philippine-U.S. Defense Alliance, which is founded on a shared commitment to regional peace, stability, and security. Our partnership has weathered many challenges in the past and continues to stand strong today. We reaffirm our commitment to the Mutual Defense Treaty, which is our cornerstone of our partnership. Our defense establishment recognized the need to work together to enhance our interoperability, increase our defense capacity, and build our resilience against emerging challenges. To this end, we agreed to explore new areas of cooperation and deepen our existing partnership in key areas, such as mutual defense, maritime security, and information intelligence sharing, and joint sales and solidarity, solidarity patrols. We also welcome the ongoing conduct of the biggest ever exercise Balikatan, which involved 70,000 forces, 12,000 U.S. personnel, 5,000 AP personnel, and 111 Australian Defense Forces, and observers from other like-minded countries which capacitates our armed forces to train and operate together, improve interoperability, and enhance our respective capabilities. With the announcement of the four additional sites, 
where enhanced defense cooperation agreement agreed locations can be developed and we reaffirm our commitment to work together in implementing the EDCA through the completion of both existing and potential projects. Lastly, we discuss opportunities for future cooperation with like-minded partners in the region. We recognize that we cannot address such a wide range of security challenges and that we, can, we need to work with other countries to share our interests in accordance with our respective national laws and policies. We reaffirm the commitment to sustain regular exchanges through existing platforms, namely the 2 plus 2 ministerial, ministerial consultations, bilater bilateral strategic dialogue, the Mutual Defense Board, Security Engagement Board, and among others. In conclusion, I want to emphasize that the Philippine-US Defense Alliance is strong and credible and we are committed to modernizing our alliance to meet the evolving security challenges of the region. This alliance is for peace and stability of the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We'll take three questions. First, we'll go to Dimitri Sevastopoulou with the Financial Times. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. I have uh, questions for both sides. Uh, Secretary Austin, can you give us a sense of what kinds and numbers of military assets and personnel that you intend to position or rotate through the ETCA sites in the Philippines? And can you explain how specifically does this enhanced cooperation increase your ability to prepare for any possible conflict with China over Taiwan? Uh, and to Secretaries Manalo and Galvez, how will the ETCA sites be used if the US and China go to war over Taiwan? And will there be any restrictions on what the US military can do with the sites? And finally, uh, Secretary Blinken, this is a China question. Your relations with China appear to be deteriorating continuously with only sporadic signs of positive developments. Is this the long-term future of US relations with China, or is there some kind of a realistic way to turn things around? And when do you expect to go to Beijing? Thank you. Well, thanks for your question, Dimitri. Um, EDCA is a key pillar uh, to uh, our alliance. It provides us the opportunity to uh, train together, uh, uh, to um, increase interoperability. And you know, Dimitri, interoperability is not something that you can show up at the last moment and snap your fingers and achieve. It's something that you got to work on uh, each and every day. And so the addition of these uh, EDCA sites uh, uh, puts us in a, re in a position to be able to uh, not only train together, but also respond to uh, meet the needs of, uh, of the Philippines uh, in the event of a crisis like a natural disaster or, or a, uh, a requirement to rapidly provide humanitarian assistance. Uh, and so I think it helps us uh, not only work together, but it helps us uh, address the needs of the Philippines as well. And I, I think it's, uh, it's essential to um, our ability to strengthen our combined uh, deterrence posture. I think it's a bit early to try to discuss uh, numbers and specific uh, 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 timing of rotations, but uh, certainly these are things that uh, Secretary Galvez and I will continue uh, to work on uh, going forward. Uh, but again, it, it is a tremendous opportunity. I would finally emphasize that uh, you know, whatever we do in the future in terms of rotations and numbers of, uh, of troops, uh, it is a joint decision between the Philippines and the, the Philippine government and the U.S. government. So again, a great opportunity. I'm excited about the ability to, to increase uh, interoperability and uh, look forward to continuing our great work together. Oh, thank you very much for your uh your question, um, what I can say at this stage is that the, uh, the new sites that have been identified, uh, the new EDCA sites, are um, mainly um, aimed at increasing or improving interoperability as well as addressing uh, potential human uh, humanitarian disasters or um, climate-related disasters. Uh, and in, in, um, in uh, operationalizing these sites, of course, much work still has to be done. We have to identify the terms of references, how these activities will be undertaken. So uh, I don't think we're really at any stage yet to answer how they might be used. They're still open to discussion. 
But I think we have already reached an understanding that the basic uh, elements of, of uh, these sites would be, uh, the basic purposes of these sites would be to address humanitarian disaster related uh, uh, events, uh, to increase and improve oper interoperability and training of uh, uh, Filipino and American assets, and also to be in a position to uh, improve interoperability and, and perhaps respond to uh, other types of security challenges. Um, Dimitri, with regard to, uh, to China, you, you've heard me say before, Secretary Austin and others say before, that the relationship uh, between our countries is among the most consequential and also the most complex uh, of any that we have. And the same could probably be said for, uh, for many other uh, countries. Um, we are, we're not reducing it to, uh, to a bumper sticker, as, again, I've said before. It has different uh, aspects to it, um, certainly competitive, uh, cooperative in other respects, uh, and in some instances uh, more adversarial. Uh, what we've been working to do, first of all, is to make sure that uh, when it comes to our own strategy and own approach, we're following through on it, making investments in ourselves uh, and our strength at home. We've done that. Uh, aligning increasingly with um, partners around the world, whether that's in Europe and Asia. And we've done that with greater convergence than I've seen uh, at any time with, uh, with key partners on the approach to some of the challenges posed uh, by China. And putting those assets together so that we're competing very vigorously in upholding our interests, upholding our values, uh, and building our vision for, for the future. Um, what I hear from countries around the world and what I believe is profoundly in our interest is for us to manage the relationship with China responsibly. Uh, and our goal is peace, security, stability, and creating uh, opportunity. It's not to uh, engage in a new Cold War. It's not to contain China. But in doing that, um, in trying to advance a world uh, that is peaceful, secure, stable, and, and uh, with more opportunity, we're going to stand up very vigorously for our, uh, for our values and for our for interests, and we're doing that with regard to China. We're also prepared to work uh, cooperatively with China where uh, it's in our interest, in their interest, and I believe in the interest of the world. And there are a number of issues that we've laid out, transnational challenges that no one country can solve alone, where it would benefit uh, all of us and benefit the world for us to find ways to, uh, to work together. Through all of this, it's, um, I believe, important to maintain uh, channels of, uh, of communication to make sure that we're uh, speaking to each other clearly. And we've certainly uh, continued to do that, uh, even through uh, what's been uh, a challenging period in our relationship. I think as our two presidents uh, agreed when they met in Bali uh, at the end of last year at the, at the G20, uh, it would be important to continue to find ways to um, strengthen those channels of communication. So we'll see. We'd look to do that uh, in the time ahead. And when it comes to my own uh, uh, visit to, uh, to China, when uh, the, the conditions are right, I'll certainly look forward to pursuing that. We'll next go to Andrea Mitchell of NBC News. Thank you very much. Uh, Secretary Austin, you just said that you first learned about the leaked documents on the 6th of April. Uh, they've been online for months. Why didn't U.S. intelligence, the rest of U.S. government, see that those leaked documents online for all those months? Is that an intelligence failure? And I'd like to ask Secretary Blinken th that same issue, as well as uh, your conversations with Foreign Minister Kuleba of Ukraine. Um, we have seen documents that indicate that Ukraine has crossed with Ukrainian agents uh, working for the government, have launched drone attacks in Russia and in Belarus, contrary to commitments that they would not do that. Are you concerned that this would, will undermine Western support for Ukraine? And can you talk about the overall damage that these leaks have caused to our, uh, our reputation for handling intelligence with our closest allies? And Mr. Foreign Minister, do you have concerns about sharing intelligence with the United States, given the fact that these leaked documents were online for you know, so many months? Uh, thanks, Andrea. Uh, the documents that uh, 
that we are aware of are dated the 28th of February and 1st of March. Uh, I, I don't know if there are other documents that, are, that have been online before. These are things that we will find, uh, find out as we continue to investigate. But, uh, but the documents that we are focused on uh, thus far, 28th of February and the 1st of March. Again, uh, we will continue to investigate and, uh, and try to determine the full scope of, uh, of the activity. But, sir, why did they know about it? Why did you know about it before April 6th? That means that they were up for at least many weeks, if not months, before your concern with you that they were in the public domain. Well, they were, they were somewhere in the, in the web, uh, and, uh, and where exactly and who had access uh, at that point. Uh, we, we don't know. We simply don't know at this point. So, uh, and again, I won't speculate, Andrea. I will tell you that we take this very seriously, and we will continue to investigate and, and turn over every rock until we find the source of this and the extent of it. So. Uh, Andrew, I'm not, I don't have much to add beyond what the Secretary said. Uh, let me just say with regard to, broadly, uh, allies and partners, uh, and these documents we have engaged with allies and partners at high levels uh, over the uh, the past uh, the past days, including uh, to uh, reassure them about our own commitment to safeguarding uh, intelligence and, of course, our commitment to our uh, security partnerships. Um, with regard to Ukraine itself, uh, I did speak to Foreign Minister Kaleba today, and uh, in speaking to him, uh, among other things, I reaffirmed our enduring support for Ukraine and for its efforts to uh, defend its territorial integrity, its sovereignty, its independence, uh, reaffirmed the extraordinary support that uh, we have provided uh, to Ukraine along with dozens of other countries uh, over the last year uh, uh, to help it defend itself, uh, support that will be uh, ongoing and indeed, as you've seen just as recently this week, additional support uh, that, uh, that was provided. Um, I'm not going to comment on specific actions that uh, uh, Ukraine takes when it comes to defending its, uh, its sovereignty, its territorial integrity, um, but we are determined uh, to um, assist Ukraine in uh, the efforts that it's making to regain the territory that's been seized from it. Uh, and I reaffirmed that commitment today in speaking to Foreign Minister Kaleba. Are you concerned about possible uh, Again, I'm not going to speak directly to any particular uh, actions, and I'm certainly not going to comment on these purported documents. Um, but uh, Ukraine has to make decisions. Uh, about how it uh, can most effectively defend itself against Russian aggression and um, take back the territory that's been seized uh, from it. Uh, we give uh, our advice as appropriate. We provide the support uh, that, uh, that, that is well known. Uh, but Ukraine uh, makes the decisions about how it actually uh, prosecutes the effort to regain its territory. Well, uh, first let me uh, also share the view of Secretary Blinken that uh, we are very confident after, especially after today's meeting, of the commitment to our alliance and our partnership. And uh, I really don't want to jump to any speculation or jump to any conclusions at this stage. We have full confidence in the investigation that will be undertaken. And uh, certainly we would have to wait for the results before we can even comment. But just let me say that uh, we are confident uh, of the uh, strength of our relationship and our growing partnership. Final question, Will Molden of the Wall Street Journal. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first, for, um, for Under Secretary Galvez, um, they mentioned exercise is going to take place later this year in the South China Sea. I wonder what countries would be uh, involved in those exercises and whether there are any concerns that these exercises or the uh, ongoing ones or different steps that the U.S. is taking with its allies and partners in the region would, would generate a, a response, a dangerous response from, from China. Um, for Secretary Austin, I wanted to ask, um, uh, irregardless of where the investigation into the documents takes us or the veracity of the documents, they're posted online and um, definitely uh, seen by the Russians uh, as well as the Ukrainians. I wonder to what degree this will affect the tactics of the expected Ukrainian uh, offensive this spring or summer. How, to what degree would their uh, tactics need to change? To what degree will you recommend changes in those tactics? Uh, finally, um, uh, for Secretary Blinken, I wanted to ask about uh, my good friend and colleague, Evan Gershkovich, 
um, you found him wrongfully uh, detained, and so wanted to ask when uh, your staff will be able to get consular access to him in Russia. What's taking so long there, and uh, will there be any leverage that you can exert? Is there any leverage that you can exert to get Russia to provide that access? Uh, and 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 what strategies, you know, uh, will you work on, uh, and will the administration be working on to free him? Thank you. The Balikatan exercises is um, its 38th uh, iteration, and uh, it's been uh, we're doing the Balikatan yearly, and uh, we don't expect uh, uh, any violent uh, reaction. Considering that um, these uh, exercises is intended for our collective defense with the U.S. and ad other allies. For today, for uh, for this uh, uh, Balikatan, we have um, the participation of, uh, as I have said earlier, 17,000 troops, including uh, uh, 12,000 Americans. Uh, 5,000 uh, Filipinos and uh, 111 Australians. We have also observers from uh, the ASEAN nations and also from uh, other uh, allies. And uh, we are happy to, to say that uh, these uh, exercises have varied uh, exercises on counterterrorism, humanitarian response, and also on uh, developing interoperability with our U.S. forces and also our Australian friends. Well, um, thanks for the question. I, I just spoke with uh, my counterpart uh, in Ukraine today, uh, Minister Oleksiy Reznikov. Uh, we talked about a number of issues, but uh, as we typically do. But he and the, the leadership remain focused on the task at hand, and I have every confidence that uh, they will do what uh, good leaders, great leaders do. Uh, they will fight the enemy and, and not uh, be driven by uh, a uh, specific plan. They have a great plan to start, uh, and uh, but only uh, uh, President Zelensky and, and his leadership really know the full details of uh, of that plan. So, um, you know, they have uh, uh, much of the capability that they need to uh, to continue to be successful. We've trained uh, an enormous number of of troops. We've provided uh, a substantial number of platforms. Uh, and uh, and so I think uh, I think he feels that he's in a they're in a, a pretty good position, and we'll stay focused on continuing to generate uh, security assistance capability, uh, so that they can con continue to be successful whenever they choose uh, to take up uh, offensive uh, operations. Uh, and again, the sustainment will be there throughout. Uh, we'll stay connected with our our uh, allies and partners. We next meet. Uh, you know, for our next round of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group meeting on, the, on uh, the 21st, and I look forward to seeing him and the rest of our colleagues at that meeting. So. Uh, and Will, as to your uh, question regarding uh, Evan, yes, I made the determination yesterday that he is being wrongfully detained uh, by Russia. Uh, President Biden had an opportunity to speak to his family today, I believe. Um, I've spoken to your colleagues, including leadership of the Wall Street Journal, multiple times about uh, about Evan's situation. Uh, when I spoke to Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, about a week ago now, just after uh, Evan was detained, uh, I, of course, pressed for his immediate release, but I also pressed for immediate consular access to him. Uh, the fact that Russia has not granted that access uh, puts it, once again, in violation of international commitments it's made, uh, commitments that are at the heart of diplomatic relations uh, between countries, and uh, the um, ability of uh, our citizens as well to, uh, uh, to be able to safely be present in, uh, in other countries. Um, I think Russia not following through on meeting its obligations to consular access, never mind the practice of, of, of detaining people arbitrarily for political purposes, uh, is going to do even more damage to Russia's standing around the world, uh, standing that has been in free fall, particularly since its reinvasion of, uh, of Ukraine last year. Uh, and I think it sends a, a very strong message to people around the world to uh, be aware of even setting foot there, lest they be arbitrarily detained, uh, and in the context of being arbitrarily detained, not even having access for the diplomats who are there um, to uh, look out for their interests and who is a matter 
of solemn international obligations that Russia has undertaken uh, should be uh, allowed that access. Um, I'm not going to get into uh, what measures, steps uh, we're taking or might take to do that. I can simply tell you that we are engaged every single day in pressing for that access as well as pressing for Evans' release. Thank you, Your Excellencies.